Good afternoon. It's my privilege to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Delon Amro. An early rock star, he is now a postdoctoral fellow for the major in criminology and applying his studies as his studies to our environmental challenges. I think he is our first presenter to talk about the legal and social crimes against the environment, ecocide, as a core international crime. As Art mentioned, Please put your questions in chat so I can facilitate our Q&A following the presentation. And please keep the intros to your questions short. Dr. Amro. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Well, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Daylon Amro, and today I will be talking about the legal considerations when we look at crimes against the planet some of the definitional issues, some of the ontological specifications of environmental crime and what that entails. And I'm thoroughly delighted and thrilled to be giving this presentation because your presence here speaks to the intellectual fervor, your activist energy, and frankly, your love of humanity to address some of the perils that our planet is facing. So here is an agenda and learning outcome for the presentation. We'll start off with the specifications of what environmental crime is. We'll then look to competing perspectives when defining these crimes. We'll take a look at the term eco-violence and how it can be leveraged with regards to teasing apart the legal considerations of these various destructive acts against the planet. We'll then look at international efforts to criminalize what is referred to as ecocide. And then as an offshoot of my studies and a project that I'm currently working on with Peter Stoic, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University, we'll look at the state corporate framework with regards to criminality, looking at the ideology, the role of denialism, climate crime, with a few case studies. And then we'll wrap it up by looking at emerging and trending topics. So before I begin, I took this from a website, and it's a Canadian press talking about the perils of a warming planet. The UK had its hottest day ever on Tuesday of this week, climbing past 40 degrees Celsius for the first time and adding to a long list of weather records in recent years. Now, dozens of countries have hit their high temperature marks in the 21st century, and experts warn that climate change has increased the frequency of extreme weather events, with certain studies showing that the likelihood of temperature in the UK reaching 40 degrees is now 10 times higher than in the pre-industrial era. Now, the report's authors also said that they had a high confidence that unless countries step up their efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions, the planet will be, on average, 2 to 3.5% warmer by the end of the century, a level experts say is sure to cause severe impacts for much of the world's population. Now, since the mid 20th century, scientists have attributed global warming to the expansion of greenhouse effects or when the atmosphere traps heat radiating from Earth towards space. In other words, there are specific gases that work in combination to block heat from escaping Earth as the planet is warming up. In turn, some geographical regions in the world are becoming drier and other regions are becoming wetter which destabilizes the makeup of natural plant communities, influencing where crops can be grown and altering migratory patterns of birds, fish, animals, and humans. In the meanwhile, glaciers, as well as other ice formations are melting, sea levels are rising and oceans are becoming warmer. The question is, does this constitute a form of criminality, eco-violence, and of course, eco-crime? what can be done in order to mitigate some of these effects of a warming planet. So it's very serendipitous that we're here talking about this given the heat wave that the planet has been experiencing. And I would like to bring to your attention a term that is bandied about in the social sciences. It's referred to as the dark figure of crime. And in criminology and sociology, the dark figure of crime is the amount of unreported or undiscovered crime. As you can see, I've kind of adapted that term and I've added the term green because this presentation talks about the dark green figure of crime. 
embracing a social constructionist perspective on certain activities that the state engages in, certain corporations engage in, and how these very crimes go unreported and undiscovered for whatever reason. And as a result of a lack of victim self-identification, many forms of environmental crime are not reported by victims. This as well as the fact that they're not easily observed or detected, and they don't make an obvious impact. All of this creates challenges for law enforcement agencies. And questions for further study include, you know, are law enforcement officers um, capable of addressing some of these crimes, investigating some of these crimes? Oftentimes that's not the case. What we need is of course, communities of practice whereby we build capacity for law enforcement personnel. Now the complexity of victimization in terms of time, space, impact, and who or what is victimized is all the more challenging. As you may or may not know, environmental crime is one of the most profitable and fastest growing areas of international criminal activity. And while we do have a suite of international laws dedicated to addressing these quote unquote crimes against the environment, there are still many challenges because a lot of these treaties and regulations are considered soft law and they lack the institutional teeth in order to mitigate these crimes against the environment. Moreover, member states debate on how to define environmental crime. And there's tremendous uncertainty in definition results in difficulty in categorizing victims neatly by type of victim and type of damage suffered. Now, the G8 consists of Germany, Japan, Britain, United States of America, France, Italy, Canada, and Russia. The G8 agenda has long included the environment. The aim is to send a high-level signal on current environmental issues such as climate protection, biodiversity, forest protection, combating environmental crime, and the protection of the world's oceans. The United Nations founded its environment program, the United Nations Environmental Program, as early as 1972. Since that time, a number of agreements under the umbrella of the United Nations has arisen steadily. The first one being the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. Then in 1992, we had the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, focusing on international relations of global environmental problem. Then we had numerous conventions following, such as the Framework on the Convention of Climate Change, the Convention on the Biological Diversity, the Kyoto Protocol, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste, and the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. So we have a great suite of international law. The problem is we still have an uptick in this dark green figure of crime and criminality. So what then are the competing perspectives? Why the challenges with regards to criminalizing ecocide and tackling environmental crime? Well, it comes down to a philosophy or ideology. According to C2 and Emmons, we have two competing perspectives. We have the strict legalist perspective, which views crimes against the environment, in other words, eco-crime, as an unauthorized act or omission that violates the law and is therefore subject to criminal prosecution and criminal sanction. On the other side of the coin, we have the social legalist perspective, which states that certain acts may not violate the provisions of criminal law, but warrant equally the label of a crime because of their deleterious effects on the environment and, of course, humanity. One need only look to the South to look at examples of toxic dumping, environmental racism, to see the social legalist perspective's mandate and agenda. Unfortunately, the dominant systems for classing crime privilege the strict legalist perspective, and it obscures social legalist perspectives. And this is all the more problematic when we have things like positive law, which, as you know, separates morality from the black letter of law, sometimes obscuring the social legalist perspective and creating loopholes for corporate criminality, state environmental criminality. So when we talk about environmental crime, we're looking at the criminal law, and the criminal law focuses on individual victims, whereas environmental legislation describes environmental harm as an offense 
against public interest. The same kind of harmful consequences can in fact result whether the offense is classified as a crime, a regulatory offense, or negligent action. Now, by focusing only on violations of criminal or regulatory law, the number and type of victims studied are going to be constrained. The victim, whether it's an individual, the general public, or the environment, is limited to the term applied in the specific context of the offense and how the offense is defined within the law. The most serious acts of deviance are consensus crimes about which there is near unanimous public agreement acts. Unfortunately, these do not factor in to environmental crime. Environmental crime are seen more as social deviations. And unfortunately, because of the labeling and the social constructionist perspective, a lot of those environmental crimes are obscured and fall by the wayside. The question is, how do we make that shift from social deviation environmental crimes to consensus crimes which warrant the label of crime and criminality? Well, classifying what is an environmental crime involves somewhat of a balancing act. It involves the act of balancing communities' interests in jobs and income, ecosystem maintenance, and of course, a biodiversity and sustainability. The reality of our age is that much of the economy is based on the exploitation of natural resources. The regulatory regime has been formulated to assist industries in committing environmental damage within the legal limits, and it's not really formulated within victims in mind or to provide clear guidelines as to which concrete acts are to be regarded as punishable offenses. Added to this is the uncertainty of understanding the notion of harm. At, at present, social scientists are trying to massage the parameters of what harm entails to victims, and this is constantly shifting in the scientific knowledge advances. So, for example, in some jurisdictions, the law permits a small amount of pollution that is considered harmless or manageable. Where it is difficult to distinguish between legal and illegal pollution, it's also hard to distinguish victims. And identifying the perpetrator in environmental cases and establishing criminal liability can be extremely difficult as the chain of causation from perpetrator to harm can be long, convoluted, and extremely complex. So, as I mentioned, we want to make that shift from social deviations to consensus crimes. And there have been some watershed moments, especially in the Canadian context. So we have the Canadian Environmental Law Association, and their casework focuses on things like air and water pollution, environmental rights, environmental assessments, administrative and constitutional law. Now, the reality of our age is that, as I mentioned, the economy is based on this exploitation. And the Canadian Environmental Law Association is a public interest organization founded in about 1970, and it operated as a specialty legal aid clinic in Toronto. Now, since joining in 1986, we've seen various interest groups, whether it's First Nations groups, environmental activists joining the organization. And what this does is it provides a platform to address things like air and water pollution, environmental racism, so on and so forth. So we are seeing small movements and small developments in order to make that paradigmatic shift from social deviations to consensus crimes, especially as they're recognized in the criminal law context. But this, of course, is hijacked by power and positionality. And in the social sciences, especially with the social legalist perspective, we look at the role that power and positionality plays in defining environmental crime, teasing apart its ontological specifications and its definitional meanings. So environmental harms are social constructions heavily influenced by social locations and power relations in society. The term green, for example, has been utilized by two diametrically opposed groups, corporate actors and environmental justice actors. Now, such a distinction situates eco-crime and environmental crime in a social constructivist framework, demonstrating what role corporations are poised to play in formulating their very own definition of environmental crime, green crime, or ecocide. For example, 
the term eco-terror. Corporatist definitions of eco-crimes entail acts of sabotage and destruction of agricultural and chemical sites in the name of protecting the environment. And you've probably heard this term before, eco-militants, eco-militancy, eco-terrorism, eco-terrorists. This is a direct result of such narrow definitions of crime. Eco-friendly protests, for example, are labeled as criminals in the eyes of law enforcement organizations. As long as corporations continue to view eco-crimes as unauthorized acts or omissions which violate the law, they're able to portray themselves as victims. And we've seen this play out a couple of years back. We had Standing Rock in the Dakota Access Pipeline and how certain indigenous communities were labeled as eco-terrorists and eco-militants and their police response leading to interactions between these groups. And it's very serendipitous to have this particular presentation because tomorrow, July 21st, we have the River Run downtown Toronto, the walk with grassy narrows for mercury justice. And we're already starting to see the way that police are starting to prepare for these marches and protests. Once again, using the ideological considerations of eco-terrorism and eco-militants to defend corporate and perhaps even state interests. So defining environmental crime. A narrow interpretation says that environmental crime is that which covers only activities prohibited by current criminal law. And going back to the role that ideology plays in state corporate criminality, you've probably all heard of the term greenwashing. Well, others suggest that the definition should also include illegal activities or formal rule breaking, whatever form of rule might be. So this would include administrative and regulatory sanctions and the influence of business interests over law and regulation and the role that greenwashing plays. Corporations engaged, for example, in non-sustainable and exploitative practices are praised as being eco-friendly and socially responsible citizens. The ability to appear green is accomplished by via massive public relations and advertising campaigns. The influence of business interests over law and regulation, conduct that might be criminal in one jurisdiction, but dealt with lesser sanctions in others, speaks to the ability of corporate entities to really adapt and appropriate the term environmental crime and really massage it for their own agenda and own interests. So definitions should include activities which are lawful, but also awful. But of course, through massive campaigns which employ greenwashing as a strategy, we have difficulty trying to really point the finger at the perpetrators. And here's one case study of how greenwashing has been utilized. So in Canada, we have the Alberta tar sands. And even the very term tar sands, rather than the less dirty sounding term oil sands, is very ideological and very deliberate, might I add. So a critical criminological analysis of the environmental degradation being wrought by the Alberta tar sands project in Canada is a case in point. These are opposing views in the way that Canada, between you know, corporate and governmental greenwashers and their critics, debate this. The term tar sands, rather than oil sands, the term tar sands best describes the immense multinational state corporate project that is currently underway in the northern part of the province of Alberta, since the task is really and truly to extract and refine naturally created tar-bearing sand into exportable and consumable oil. Now, what is undeniable is that the tar sands project, as we have chosen to call it, is having profound effects on Canada's economy and ecology. Its diplomatic and trade relations with the USA and its ability to create Canadian energy security. It's also affecting Canada's capacity as a sovereign nation to sign and follow up on international treaties and protocols aimed at reducing forms of global environmental degradation, including global warming, carbon dioxide emissions, environmental pollution, and water depletion. But this is one of many examples in the way that greenwashing in Canada unfolds. The use of politically charged terms over others kind of deflects attention. It obfuscates the true havoc, damage, and destruction that takes place on Canadian soil. 
Another case study would be the use of greenwashing by the beloved company Nutella. Growing up, I loved using Nutella spread on my toast and sandwiches. But the environmental risk comes from normal social practice. The question is whether environmental harm can fit neatly within existing criminal justice systems. And I refer to this as the Nutella dilemma. This figure is the Nutella global chain value system. And we see that perhaps with increasing awareness and scientific knowledge of the environment and the impact of harmful practices, this will influence law reform in the field. However, this raises the debate of crime versus social harm. There is need for criminal justice systems to function with certainty in order to be fair and consistent. So if you wanted to have Nutella, for example, on your toast for breakfast, you need to conduct investigations into five separate countries just to find the source of the raw ingredients, not to mention the processing and transportation practices. How to replant a lot of trees because there is massive deforestation that also leads to global warming. For example, because it's made with palm oil, Ferrero, the mother company, if you will, gets almost 80% of its palm oil from Malaysia, according to the AFP news agency. And the rest of its supply comes from Brazil, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. So burning down forests leads to biodiversity, which increases air pollution and concomitantly leads to climate change. Since oil palm trees grow in tropical climates near the equator, palm oil has been and continues to be a major driver of deforestation of the world's most biodiverse forests. So here again, we have a normal social practice perpetrated by a corporation, but very hard to really tease apart the criminal considerations and the criminal elements of its global value chain. And of course, the greenwashing comes in when we go to the website of Nutella and we see a wonderfully written mission statement highlighting their commitment to sustainability. Greenwashing, of course, is a prominent strategy, folks, employed by corporations to respond to various strands of environmentalism. We explore how greenwashing is used to deflect attention away from the ecologically destructive practices of corporations, convincing consumers that they are, in fact, environmentally conscious and that they take on a green position. This entails consuming a certain product instead of questioning the production of these products and the effects on our planet. So greenwashing at its finest. So the challenge then, what is the challenge? Well, the challenge is for victims, okay? It includes convincing authorities that the harm actually has taken place. I have family in Brazil who have literally observed some of these practices taking place within the Nutella global value chain. But once again, it is hard to convince authorities that the harm is actually taking place. How do you quantify the level and extent of harm? The causal connection of the illegal act is also very hard to present and prove for that matter. And then of course, identification of all victims poses a logistical problem. Some folks may be intimidated. You know, Peter and I are talking right now about looking at the role environmental defenders play in environmental justice movements. And as you may or may not know, um, we have a lot of examples whereby environmental defenders are imprisoned and sometimes even murdered for trying to outline the identification of criminality and, of course, victimization. So environmental victims have a very, very tough battle when it comes to proving their case. So new approaches by criminal courts in dealing with collective victimization and whether jurisdictions allow for designated representatives of a community is extremely problematic. What is reasonable in these cases is to ensure the victim's rights, but also avoid basic logistical problems. So examples include perhaps, you know, as I mentioned, intimidation tactics used by the state and by certain corporations. So this brings us to another term I'd like to present. You may have heard this term before. This is a book that Peter Stewart and I, once again, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University and I 
authored about two years ago, Spheres of Transnational Eco-Violence, looking at environmental crime, human security, and justice. And eco-violence explores the links between environmental scarcities of key renewable resources and violent rebellions, insurgencies, ethnic clashes, social conflicts, so on and so forth. And in that, we find examples of threats to human security and threats to environmental security. So detailed contemporary studies of eco-violence would include things like the Gaza, South Africa, Pakistan, Rwanda. It shows how environmental scarcity has played a limited to significant role in causing social instability and how these contexts lead to tremendous human suffering. <clears throat> and in the book, we use Johann Galtung's definition of violence. For Johann Galton, violence is present when human beings are being influenced so that their actual somatic and mental realizations are below their potential realizations. <clears throat> and what that means is the definition of violence is really pinned down to one question. Why are some human beings unable to fully actualize their potential? For Johann Galtung, violence is the act of preventing persons from reaching their physical and psychological potential. And in cultural violence, Johann says that I see violence as avoidable insults to basic human needs and more generally to life, lowering the real levels of need satisfaction below what is potentially possible. Threats of violence are also violence. So we see examples of eco-violence in environmental scarcities, in the depletion of resources, in deforestation, in the intimidation or threats against environmental defenders, and so on. So we see a long list of eco-violence unfolding in many different circumstances, in many different cases. And this leads us to the term ecocide, which is you know, kind of an offshoot of eco-violence. And a brief history of ecocide, environmental impacts of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War, War were recorded. And with that, we saw the tremendous detrimental effects on the environment of the use of this particular chemical, Agent Orange, and how it impacted uh, the inhabitants of this country, you know, the citizens of this country, the biodiversity of this country, the habitat of certain animals, so on and so forth. We also saw examples whereby ecocide, the term being applied to a variety of environmental harms perpetrated around the world. The increased support for introducing crime as an ecocide has been understood as a broader consciousness, an environmental consciousness, raising about the severity of climate, pollution, biodiversity crises our planet is facing. And Polly Higgins was one of the architects of this term ecocide and she was an environmental lobbyist, the co-founder of the Stop Ecocide program. Now, since its launch in 2021, the Stop Ecocide Foundation has presented an independent expert panel, and they have formulated a new approach to addressing crimes against the environment, leveraging the definition of ecocide to gain some political traction that it had been endorsed since you know, the Belgian parliament, the United Kingdom's Labour Party, and of course, the world's first global citizens assembly had deliberated on ways that we can really criminalize environmental crimes against the environment. But ecocide also includes acts of business, such things would include oil extractions in North America, mining in Central America, and deforestation in South America. And quite recently, even Russia's attacks on Ukraine have been seen as flagrant examples of ecocide. So since the invasion of the Ukraine by Russian forces in February 22, a group of environmental activists state that Russia has committed more than 150 cases of ecological crimes. The Ukrainian non-governmental organization EcoAction, for example, is recording cases of what it says are environmental crimes in military actions by Russian troops that causes serious pollution and harm to the ecosystem and people. The EcoAction team, furthermore, is investigating these environmental offenses. They've recorded examples of soil, water, and air pollution, as well as damage to nuclear power plants, 
oil depots, seaports, and hazardous waste storage facilities. Even more, the invasion by Russian forces by late February, according to the UN analysis, found that fighting with separatist forces in the eastern Donbass region has affected, damaged, or destroyed ecosystems within an area of at least 500,000 hectares, including 18 nature reserves and thousands of forest fires, creating tremendous havoc for the citizens of Ukraine. Ukraine, if you may or may not know, has 15 active nuclear reactors. And throughout the war, there have been reports of Russian soldiers disturbing the radioactive ground near Chernobyl and firing the southeastern facilities, setting it on fire. And as a result, this human misery and ecological devastation, more than 1,000 legal, environmental, and peacekeeping experts have issued an open letter stating that action needs to be done. So ecocide can take on many different faces, from corporate criminality to, of course, state criminality and war crimes. So what are we planning to do? How do we begin criminalizing and codifying the definitional parameters of ecocide? Well, currently there are four core international crimes, genocide, war crime, crimes against humanity, crimes of aggression. And these crimes are dealt with by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, and the introduction of ecocide could play an important role in increasing accountability and access to reparations for environmental destruction. However, it's important to acknowledge the limitations of criminalization as a means of addressing environmental destruction. So as I mentioned, Polly Higgins' uh, foundation, Stop Ecocide, the independent expert panel states that they've spent about six months preparing this 165 word definition, working with outside experts along the way. And the lawyers from around the world are working together to draft a legal definition for a crime that hadn't had the same name under international law, and that term is ecocide. And the term broadly fits in with the other crimes identified by the International Criminal Court. And the definitions unveiling by the panel of 12 lawyers was a very big step in terms of a global campaign, a global effort to prevent future environmental disasters, such as you know, the deforestation of the Amazon or actions that contribute to climate change generally. And there it is, there is the definition. So as you can see, it's taken on quite interesting approaches with regards to the severity, the widespread nature of the damage, the long-term damages, and the environment, taking a very capacious definition. It's biosphere, it's cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, as well as outer space. Now, in a draft of the definition by the Stop Ecocide Foundation, a Netherlands-based coalition said that they hoped the proposed definition could provide a basis for consideration for a new international crime. Now to remedy this, the Global Witness Organization has joined a growing movement and it's being called to establish ecocide as an international crime. And a proposed definition is just the start of a long process, folks. So what it would take for the ICC to adopt ecocide and to amend its Rome statute is quite complex. So the few steps that they would have to overcome include things like, well, one of the International Criminal Court's 123 member countries, which don't include the US, China, or India, might I add, would have to submit a definition to the United Nations Secretary General. The proposal must then be voted on by a majority of members of the ICC at the annual assembly in order to be considered. Once the final text for an amendment is discussed and agreed upon, two thirds of member countries must vote in favor. Once the road is ratified, there must be enforcement in countries. And while it may become a criminal offense in the countries where it is ratified, ratifying nations may arrest non-nationals on their own soil for ecocide and ecocidal crimes. This means citizens of countries that are not members of the ICC could still be affected. Now, while this is very ambitious, you can anticipate a lot of challenges. And here they are. So if the amendment is approved, states could nonetheless choose not to ratify it. 
as I mentioned, international law is sometimes seen as soft law. It's sometimes seen as toothless in its enforcement. And it places limits on the ICC's ability to exercise jurisdiction over their territories and nationals. The panel's criminalization of this term wanton acts is, in my opinion, very vague. It can introduce subjectivity, a subjective cost-benefit analysis in which prosecutors would need to prove that an ecocidal act was clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. Then, of course, the ICC's lack of jurisdiction over legal persons, i.e. corporations, will limit the impact of the new law. And then, of course, we have the court's limited resources. We're talking capacity. And then, of course, investigation, the operational selectivity, access to evidence, and state cooperation. So in the wake of the independent expert panel's launch of the new definition, there were several international law academics that offered critiques of this definition and its scope. And most notable was the critique of the requirement that the perpetrator has knowledge of their attack and will cause damage to the environment. That is key here. And this brings in that subjectivity piece that I mentioned, right, the cost benefit analysis, and of course, the vague term wanton acts. It's going to be hard to prove liability, folks. So as environmental harms can be slow to materialize, ecocide is likely to throw up a range of challenges surrounding proving causality and responsibility, erecting barriers when it comes to gathering evidence, and of course, finding relevant experts, but most importantly, witnesses. So while we have definitional and ontological challenges, there are also logistical challenges. And this then would bring us to the second or third segment of this presentation, looking at the symbiosis between the state and corporations. And of course, this idea of state corporate criminality, state environmental criminality, corporate environmental criminality. This is a book written by Stanley Cohen, a very prominent sociologist. And in this book, he talks about the strategies of corporate criminality. Tactics include things like stealthy misdirection, misinformation, paying for legal harassment, as I mentioned with the legal um, problems that environmental defenders have found themselves in, and most importantly, media control, looking to the ideological dimensions of the problem. So, you know, Stanley was concerned with crimes and harms that are perpetrated by legitimate bodies, such as states and corporations, and with the way in which these acts and omissions, the impacts and consequences have been routinely ignored, overlooked, or simply denied. How can you deny these wanton acts by states and by corporations? So in various influential works, you know, he looked at various forms of criminality and the horrors and the indignities that inflicted humanity and others, right? the environment, non-human animals, so on and so forth. This is no great effort at camouflage or disguise is required if the perpetrators or conspirators can enlist in the willing cooperation of the many or most in buying into these cover-ups, in buying into denials and the comfort avoidance of certain challenges. So as I mentioned, you know, the tactics of misdirection, misinformation, paying for legal harassment in media control are very powerful strategies used by the powerful. And they are continuing to use these strategies even to this day. And I'll give you some fascinating examples of that. But first let's, pivot a bit and look at another case study. 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. I'm not going to go through the logistics as you've probably read this case from cover to cover, but I will talk about the ideological considerations and the role that denial and misinformation played. So we're talking about the deep water horizon explosion. This was a state facilitated corporate cover up of environmental crimes in the Gulf. And using the concept of state corporate environmental crime, we can apply the case study analysis of, you know, secondary data sources, including publicly available government reports, corporate documents, academic sources, and journalistic accounts to examine the causes of the blowout, and most importantly, the response to the spill. 
So the causes of the deep water horizon explosion were you know, rooted in a history of federal development of offshore oil industries, organizational actions of corporations most directly involved, namely BP, Transocean, and Halliburton, and undertaken in close coordination between the federal government and BP alongside privately contracted oil spill response organizations, the response to the spill was classified as a cover-up, a corporate cover-up by many environmental activists. And this was accomplished through scientific propaganda and censorship censorship of images and information. This is the 21st century, folks, and we have certain mechanisms in place that deliberately censor and cover up information. For example, there were federal restrictions blocking access to cleanup operations, breaches in airspace, limiting public visibility of the spill, policing the media blackout was in intricate matrix of federal and local law enforcement, and of course, private security companies hired by no other than BP. So we see the synthesis, we see the really interesting interaction between state and corporate environmental criminality in such cases. Another really interesting case study is of course, the role that corporations play in leading to these unprecedented rising temperatures, the political economy perspective on blameworthy harms, the politics of denial, and what is referred to as the tropic of chaos. So many criminologists would argue that the abject failure of the United States government to act to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions that are primarily responsible for global warming and the socially organized denial of climate change that shapes that failure can be conceptualized as state corporate criminality. And this is precisely why Peter and myself are using this type of framework to really advance the envelope and really massage the parameters of state and corporate criminality. Now, the state corporate crime framework was developed by criminologists and is now being adapted by green criminologists, and it provides an important political economy perspective on these blameworthy harms. Now, these movements have already led to the militarization and securitization of borders in the global north as we have neoliberal economic policies intersect with climate change to produce declines and for example, agricultural and pastoral economies in the global south, leading to increasing mobility of irregular migrants seeking a minimum of food and or physical security. And of course, the violence that attends and accompanies climate change. Violence around the globe, but particularly in those parts in the global south, referred to as the Tropic of Chaos resource wars and other forms of international conflict that will increase and perhaps provoke, let's say, the use of nuclear weaponry if these climate crimes continue unabated. Increased warfare could also sabotage the very planetary cooperation required to reduce further climate change and global warming. So we're now taking this state corporate environmental crime framework and applying it to climate crimes, and carbon criminality. And there we have it, climate crimes and carbon criminality and state corporate environmental crime and environmental eco-violence. So Ronald Kramer in his book looks at these various forms of state and corporate crime. And he argues that, you know, green criminologists should essentially use this framework and use the concept of state corporate criminality. And he aligns himself with green criminology and its perspective for expanding the older environmental approaches to crime and victimization research. He focuses on analysis on the relations between crime or criminality and environmental laws, as well as the evolving meaning of environmental crime and of course harm and how we can leverage these different terms to achieve ecological justice. He's written quite a bit on historical overviews of global warming, climate change, environmental science, green criminology, and the problems of fossil fuel extraction, rising emissions, and of course, you know, four specific types of criminality in the ecocide context. And here they are. So we have four climate crimes. 
This is a nice taxonomy that is used by green criminologists. The first is crimes of continued extraction of fossil fuels and emissions of greenhouse gases. So really what we're referring to here is crimes of continued extraction of fossil fuels. And these crimes include things like, you know, the carbon majors or organizational corporations and state actors responsible for, I would say, approximately 70% of the world's emissions. And these criminals include, you know, uh, former President Trump, you know, to be so bold and contra controversial, and his administration, the actions to resurrect the Keystone XL pipeline to promote coal and continuing drilling, both offshore and on federal lands for oil. The second type is the crimes of political omission or the failure to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. So we're talking about you know, negligent crimes, and this refers to political failures of the international political community, certain presidential administrations, the lack of planning for mitigating emissions. Other crimes of omission include you know, perhaps withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement, which also, as you know, uh, Trump's administration did, and plans for killing clean power and defendants of the Children's Trust lawsuit. So here we have, you know, other examples of you know, the politics of denial, but also the politics of total omission when it comes to climate crimes, and carbon criminality. Number three, crimes of socially organized denial. We're talking about, you know, the blood for oil or the politics of armed lifeboat, Pentagon emissions, militaristic adaptation to climate disruptions, whether it's military buildups, deportations, locking up of young children in cages, separating them from undocumented parents, building of border walls. You know, these crimes are unjust and militaristic adaptations, and they exclude or push back any progressive, ecologically just policies from entering the political arena, such as the rejection of the Green New Climate Deal. And last but not least, we have, you know, number four, which is climate crimes of empire. So this would include things like the ideological denial of climate change, the rejection of climate change, and of course, uh, the neo-colonial ambitions and campaigns orchestrated by powerful nations in the North and the West. So the overall objective of these groups and these organizations is about investing locally and globally in the transition of you know, fossil fuels to solar, wind, and energy, rebuilding public commons and achieving climate justice. This is the main objective of green criminologists. And we need to tackle these four types of climate crimes in order to do so. And this is a little fun example for those that are you know, users or subscribers to Netflix. Well, you've heard of the term Netflix and chill. I mean that in the most literal sense for those that like to binge their favorite show, whether it's the next season of Bridgerton or whatever your favorite uh, films may be, Netflix has an estimated of one hour of streaming per user on its platform produces well under 100 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's a unit of measure that indicates a carbon footprint unprecedented for certain streaming services. More specifically, the Carbon Trust says the European average is about 55 to about 60 grams of CO2 for every hour of streaming videos. And as for YouTube, you know, a, a report by researchers at Bristol University, based on estimates of the streaming site's usage in 2019, calculated that watching videos on the streaming site produced CO2 of more than 11 million tons a year, similar to a city of Glasgow or Frankfurt. So we do have a lot of interesting questions to ask companies, corporations like Netflix, and the way in which they've kind of skirted their social responsibility and their ethics with regard to, you know, maintaining sustainable practices. And then, of course, you know, we have the role that ideology, denial, and climate change plays with regards to those four identified climate crimes. So as I mentioned before, blameworthy harms, right? These unrecognized blameworthy harms that are not condemned and sanctioned, right? This is research conducted by Agnew, and he argues that climate change appears to fall into this category, right? It's seen as an unrecognized and blameworthy harm. Why is it 
this case, right? The importance of investigating the nation state is important because the nation state is a major facilitator of harm in its own right, either in its own or in conjunction with specific sectional interests, such as particular transnational corporations, as we've seen with Netflix and other streaming services, who have been proven to falsify documents with regards to their emissions and their assessments as to the impact it may have on the environment. So, Given the catastrophic scenarios detailed in the scientific literature on climate change, green criminologists should treat the grave blameworthy harms, both present and future, resulting from global warming and climate change as serious crimes that, for whatever reason, need to be stopped recognized as a blameworthy harm, right? They need to be seen as conventional crimes, not social deviations. And the state corporate crime approach provides a useful tool for examining these crimes related to climate change and of course, you know, global warming. And this is where it gets, once again, a little more entertaining and informative. I had the abundance of fortune by achieving a small grant, which allowed me to essentially watch television, lots and lots of television, for about three months. And in that uh, three to four month period, I looked at how environmental advocacy was framed in American television, okay? And the reason I did this was because I wanted to see the ideological considerations, the ideological dimensions of state corporate criminality. And the concept of state corporate crime, as I mentioned, refers to these serious harms that result from the interaction of, you know, politics, but also economics. And the idea emerged out of this recognition that some of the organizational crimes are of the collective product of the interaction between business and, of course, the state. And in this particular study, and I call it, it's not easy being green because let's face it, folks, it's certainly not easy being an environmental activist. While I was reviewing hours and hours of television, I saw the manner in which environmental advocates were framed. And working with a research team, I came up with these particular frame. These five frames were used to really identify and designate environmental advocacy on television. So the first frame is the radical frame. In this frame, certain fictional characters are portrayed as environmental advocates. They're seen as unstable, obsessive, and sometimes even violent individuals who refuse to entertain and tolerate the opinions of others in their pursuit of environmental justice. The eccentric frame suggests that those engaged in environmental advocacy demonstrate unconventional behavior, they deviate from societal norms and expectations, and frankly, they're often the butt end of a joke. The third frame was seen as the anti-development progress frame. This views environmentalists as obstacles to development and progress. And such characters are seen as compromising the ambitions of a capitalist pro-consumption culture, opting for more balanced relationships with nature. The alarmist frame depicts environmental advocates as sensationalists who exaggerate their opinions in a concerted attempt to incite worry and panic. And their views are constantly undermined or ridiculed in an attempt to weaken the credibility of their stance. And then the effeminate frame, which I found fascinating, this characterizes environmental advocacy as kind of unmanly, right? The individual's gender is discursively constructed as the polar opposite of taken for granted assumptions surrounding conventional tropes of masculinity. And while the research project was extremely fascinating, we saw tremendous commonalities between life and art. So on the left here, here's a clip from a show called The Big C. And in this show, the brother of the main character is an environmental advocate. He's an activist who was always going on about climate change and the need to carpool, the need to curtail the emissions of greenhouse gases. And he's always being arrested by police officers. He's always being detained and he will not stop. He's seen as an incorrigible character in this show. And in this particular scene, he's at a car dealership yelling at people who are buying the latest trending SUV and he was subsequently arrested. 
On the right, you have the very famous Greta Thunberg, and you see the manner in which both of these characters, one fictional and one in the real world, are socially ostracized and sometimes even bullied. President Trump once tweeted that Greta, and I quote, must work on her anger management problems and go to a good old fashioned movie with a friend. So all of these things are part of an intricate matrix of state and corporate criminality. You have these socially and ecologically harmful practices evading criminalization and codification. And then you have the politics of denial. You have the use of critical discourse analysis, framing environmental activists as alarmists, as co-conspirators, as sometimes even unpatriotic. So this is all part of the ideological campaign of the state corporate crime framework. Excuse me, Delon. Yes. We're running out of, we're getting short of time. So could you just try and cut it off so we have a few questions, please? Absolutely, absolutely. And well-timed, might I add. So how do we move forward? Well, the state corporate crime framework has three useful characteristics. It directs attention away or towards the way in which crime emerges at organizational intersections, in this case, the intersection of institutions of accumulation and institutions of governance. Second, it approaches the state as a nexus of relationships rather than a set of governmental institutional actors. And third, it approaches state corporate contexts as relational processes and directs attention to the vertical relationships between different levels of organizational action in government and business. And I'm just going to head to the very last slide. We are going to see emerging and trending topics. And one is the public trust doctrine. And we're starting to see a change in the manner in which we view ecocide and crimes against the environment. Now, the public trust doctrine has been used in countries around the world to protect bodies of water, for example, shorelines, freshwater, wildlife, and other natural resources. In 2017, New Zealand made news of granting one river legal rights of a human being. And though the courts were only recently recognizing this river as a living entity, the Maori, the indigenous folks of this country, have always considered the river to be endowed with a spirit of its own. And we're also seeing this, of course, in you know, certain other countries. In Ecuador, they became the first nation to give constitutionally protected rights to, once again, bodies of water. So this is a very exciting time for ecocide, a very exciting time for environmental activists. And I wanna leave you with this. This is a project we are working on at Ontario Tech University. Peter and I created this. It is a global environmental crime database. What you do is you take your cursor, you click on any country in the world and you will see a list of environmental crime legislation, case studies, international ratified treaties and regulations, and of course, you will see the way forward in terms of anecdotes, interviews of professionals working in the field. And this is an open education resource that will hopefully be completed by 2024. And it is a passion project of mine, and I'm very happy to be a part of this. And folks, I want to thank you so much for giving me this platform to speak with you today. And I will conclude right there. Thanks very much, Dylan. Uh, a lot of, a lot of things to cover in a short period of time. And uh, I thank you for doing that. It was a most interesting presentation for me. I'm sort of boggled. And how I'm going to approach my wife about canceling my Netflix is really a new <laughs> problem. Uh, so we're gonna start some questions, okay? And so I have the first question and I'd like to ask John Leg to stand by to be the, set, the next question, please. So uh, during your presentation, you talked about how uh, various conflicts, war like Vietnam and Ukraine, have very, very, very clearly demonstrated, okay, what they're doing to the environment. And I'm wondering if you have any connection in your mind about ego side and the long sort of awaited world peace problem, whether there's some connection, whether one could be an incentive for the other. Could you just talk about that, please? Absolutely. Well, uh, it's very funny you mentioned that. In the book that Peter and I have co-authored, um, we talk about this concept of environmental security and, of course, human security. And uh, the UN Commission on Human Security 
has a very concise definition. It goes something to the, the ring of human security means protecting the vital core of all human lives in a way that enhances freedom and human fulfillment. And ecocide, in my mind, is a, a threat to both human security and environmental security. And what we need to do is draw these linkages between these siloed approaches to peace and harmony in this universe, in this planet for that matter, because once we stop siloing environmental security and human security, we will see really interesting vistas of inquiry where we can start to make these very concrete links between human security and environmental security. And I think the criminalization of ecocide is a step in the right direction with the ICC weighing in on this amendment. Ah, great, thank you very much. So I'm going to call on John Lake and Peter McKinnon. You have the next question, please, after that. Uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, Dr. Omrao, uh, a very, very uh, stimulating presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is really just an intellectual attempt to put together the where things might come together, but one cannot uh, predict the future. And I think we're all, at least within this organization, that is Canadian Association of the Club of Rome, we're just, we're trying to see how things can get moving, action. So my question is in one sentence, how can the broadest international political forum, and I, I'm arbitrarily saying that is the UN General Assembly, and the broadest international legal forum, the International Criminal Court, how can they be put together to advance action on the most existential problem, that is, climate change. And I mean, that's not a, that's not an easy question. It's a pretty broad one. But uh, and you, you will probably know about the structure of the UN. And items of international security are covered by what's called the first committee. And then of course, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. That's also more or less a UN body. Uh, and then the outside uh, actors, the international uh, conferences, Stockholm, Kyoto, and I'm missing one, and then Paris. So uh, again, these are actors who have tried to contribute to the problem. Uh, can you make some general comments about how the ICC and the largest or most important political forum, international that is, uh, the UN General Assembly, how they might come together uh, at some future point for action. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. And really what I think it comes down to is uh, capacity. It's building capacity, building communities of practice, you know, one of the reasons why we decided to build this database is because, as I mentioned, these different perspectives seem so siloed. And as I mentioned, with the ICC process, it, it really is an uphill battle because what it comes down to is, of course, you know, legal realism. Legal realism is this term in international law that really talks about how powerful nations will always kind of tilt the scale in favor of their own interests and their own power. And I think legal realism is the most authentic approach to understanding what's happening in our you know, world right now. Because as I mentioned, you know, one of the international courts, um, you know, 123 members, I believe it is, right? They're really going to have to uh, really put forth this amend this proposal. And one of those member countries, which for whatever reason doesn't include the US or China, which you know is problematic in and of sectional interests. They have to submit a definition of ecocide to the United Nations Secretary General. And then the proposal has to be voted on by a majority of members by the ICC. And if history has taught us anything, we've seen the manner in which power and positionality 
always comes to the fore when we are trying to come to some kind of consensus in the international community. And you know, legal realism as that perspective will always kind of shake us from our you know, utopian sentiments and really remind us that what really needs to happen at its core is the organizational structures, the institutional organs of these particular organizations, and then really teasing apart you know, what can be done in order to you know, democratize, to use that term, because even that's kind of problematic when we say democratize an institution, because one person's democracy is another person's tyranny. And we've seen that time and time again with the manner in which you know, the international community has acted or failed to act in certain circumstances. So the question you're asking is extremely important. For me, I see it more as a thought experiment and as a beacon of light moving forward as we kind of navigate these really interesting debates and conversations about what role the ICC plays in criminalizing and codifying ecocide. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Devon. Could I call on Peter McKinnon and Ted Manning? You're on standby. Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, interesting and uh, very rich uh, uh, conversation. My phone is ringing here. Let me deal with it. Sorry, it coincided with my call. No worries. Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I actually, I think you answered my question, but I'd like to pose it yet again, because I think there's been several postings along the same theme, and I'd like to embellish it a bit. So my question I posted before you actually answered it is a question, is it possible for the International Criminal, Criminal Court to hear cases of crimes against humanity due to, quote, bad climate policy and or blocking such policy? And I was thinking of things like, you know, be it corporations or governments, uh, or as you raised the point, the collusion between governments and corporations, as well as, you know, uh, class action suits and so on, different mechanisms to press the case. But could, and I think as you answered, but could the court actually hear such cases in the future? Yes, I mean, I think that is the push. I mean, we are seeing a lot of interesting conversations had at the international level regarding what can be done. And what immediately comes to mind is restorative justice, right? We've seen restorative justice implemented and exercised within national contexts. I would love to see what that may look like at an international level. But of course, you know, we have so many of those challenges that I outlined with regards to the identification of criminality, the liability, of perpetrators, and of course, even the logistical pieces, getting these witnesses to share, let's say, um, victimization impact assessments or reports and how they've been impacted by, um, disproportionately, might I add, a warming planet. And that's going to be the major challenge I find is the, you know, selective operationality of how, you know, those defending the rights of the weak and the voiceless are really going to get these folks together so their lived experiences can be heard in an international form, hopefully leading to some kind of change. But restorative justice has been practiced, you know, in the United States, it's been practiced in New Zealand, it's been practiced in Greenland. So I'm hoping that this is a launch pad for restorative practices at the international level. Well, if I may, just as a quick supplementary, uh, an echo side metaphor, uh, the Exxon Valdez, uh, for example, and Bhopal were both in, in accidents of the past. Uh, and no doubt there's been some you know, a process of reclamation about all those. Do they fit the metaphor of what we're talking about here as examples of echo side? Well, absolutely. Without a doubt, absolutely. Especially when you look at some of the, the documents in India, the Bhopal example, I mean, there were regulatory failures at that plant. And some, some to this day would argue that they weren't aware of it, but new research has revealed that yes, in fact, you know, plant managers, even members of uh, the major corporations which are housed you know, in the Western world were well aware of the regulatory failures, but did nothing. And that according to a, a green criminologist perspective would be an act of omission and an act of commission. You happy about that, Peter? Then I'll call on Ted Manning, please. And Bill Reese, you're in the standby, please. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to follow this up uh, a little more specifically and yet less specific. Uh, certainly, we're all familiar with those very individual incidents where people can, in fact, identify damages to them or to, or to their group. I'm looking more at the possibility of broad class action suits 
uh, at a very broad level, even against a large international organization, uh, or uh, particularly writs of mandamus, where they've been found uh, to lack the steps necessary that they are mandated to carry out, whether it's a government, local, national, or international. Uh, it strikes me that it has potential. The big question for me is how do you make it happen? Yeah, no, that's an, an extremely important question. And I think of the Alberta Court of Appeal, right? Yes. And what's happening right now with uh, the oil pipeline rupture. And I think it was, uh, oh gosh, Rieger, Rieger versus Plain, I think. And this appeal decision, it's really instructive when we talk about you know class action lawsuits. Yeah. And what I'm hoping is that these particular cases are going to serve as a, you know, a, a, a framework or an archetype for what can be leveraged at the international scene. Granted, there will be you know, tremendous logistical issues trying to get this off the ground, but at mm -hmm. least we are seeing a lot of you know, really interesting case studies at the national context, which hopefully can be used in an international scene, international arena. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan, Peter. Uh, Bill Reese, could you start on your first question, please? Yeah, I'm going to combine that with my second so we can cover some ground here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got the next question after that. Very interesting uh, inputs here. Listen, I, I'm a biologist and uh, I suppose a thermodynamicist of ecosystems. And the fact is that all human activity affects ecosystems. So doesn't this really all boil down to moderation in all things? There are reasonable limits to the levels of exploitation of, and of economic growth. And if people don't recognize this, then eco-crime, which is excess, excess exploitation beyond regenerative and, and pollution limits is inevitable. So if, if we put that in that framework, I would say that agriculture, especially modern production agriculture is by far the greatest of eco-crimes. And it is an absolutely essential activity to sustain so many humans uh, at current levels of dietary standards. But it destroys more habitat, drives more population and species extinction than any other human activity. So how can we reasonably draw the line uh, between what is necessary in terms of human exploitation of nature and that which is excessive? And I would argue that you can't address that question without confronting the reality that Climate change and a hundred other symptoms are symptoms of overshoot. There are too many people consuming and polluting too much. And we call that excess eco-crime, but we're, we're avoiding the, the obvious that, that connect all the dots. The silos you speak of are because all of the individual groups facing individual issues fail to see that they're all symptoms of overshoot. Too many people consuming too much. So that wraps up. Uh, my issue here. I just wonder if that's not the case. Aren't we shooting at the wrong fish in this barrel? Yeah, no, that's a very poignant question. And in fact, a lot of farmers in the United States, for example, you know, uh, environmental activists have questioned their practices and there've been movements for sustainable agriculture, but still you fall down that rabbit hole where, you know, what is sustainable, what is unsustainable. And, you know, once again, the power of framing, the power of discourse and labeling comes to the fore and the manner in which certain groups have become, you know, ostracized or labeled as, you know, uh, perpetrators of these ecocidal acts. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said excess. I mean, I think it was wasn't it President Jimmy Carter who once um, tried to convince folks to like, you know, reduce the use of thermostats during the oil crisis? And, you know, that's by no stretch of the imagination uh, a luxury. People need to be warm. They need to be cooled during you know, certain seasons. But his point was, you know, moderation. Moderation is key. And then that, you know, led to certain folks, fringe folks, labeling him as unpatriotic. Right. Because he was the president at the time and he's you know, telling Americans to reduce the use of thermostats to you know, conserve energy. So it's it's one of those situations where, you know, we have to temper quite lightly. And I think moderation is the real driving point behind it. That's the crux of the argument. Thank you for that. Uh, just one brief comment. I once had a paper rejected by a very prominent journal because it was making arguments around the, the question of excess and the need to cut back. The paper was rejected on grounds that the whole um, ideology underpinning the paper was un-American and therefore unacceptable for publication. Just to According to my critical discourse analysis <laughs> research project, 
Yes. You would have been seen as an anti-development, unpatriotic yes. scholar, right? I, I plead guilty to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill and everyone. So uh, I have the next question, and I'll ask uh, Vic Buxton to stand by for the next one. So at the very end of your uh, presentation, you talked about the data, database that you created, uh, which was really got my interest initially, okay, when I spoke to you the first time. Uh, which it links between environmental crime, human security and biosecurity policies and legislation. So you've put all this together. So my question is, who do you hope is going to use it and for what purpose? Absolutely. So as I mentioned, it's going to be an open education resource. You want all students at Ontario mm -hmm. Tech to use this database. Um, they can use it for their graduate studies. They can use it for MRPs, research projects. This, of course, is going to be accessible all across the world. So, in fact, Peter and I, we are planning to interview some folks from Interpol. We're planning on interviewing um, government officials from select countries as well. And the idea is to build capacity and communities of practice. Because what we want to do is really de-silo these different approaches between environmental security and human security. And one of the tiles on that website is going to look at corruption. And we have an index of corruption within certain countries and how this essentially fits into the framework of state corporate environmental crime. So to answer your question, it's going to be students, practitioners in the field. It's going to be researchers, uh, people from all walks of life that are interested in this collective uh, question. What can we do to protect our planet and humanity? So you get this right in my mind then. So by comparing one country against the other in their legislation and how successful they're being. We're looking for the best practice so we can develop that to go move ahead. Is that what your Absolutely. Plan is? In fact, one of the case studies I used in New Zealand was the fact, or Ecuador, let's use the example of Ecuador, was the constitutional rights given to nature. And yeah. how can we leverage that example to other countries? And if you're in another country where you may not have constitutional considerations for nature, you may say, hey, you know what? This sounds pretty interesting. Maybe we need to have a we get in brief and have a round table about what we can do as a country to follow suit. Right. Thanks, Alan. So uh, Vic Buxton. Yes. Yes, my question it relates to the UN system in general. I've worked as a consultant for many years to all five different UN agencies after retiring from Environment Canada, where I was engaged in regulation development and the pursuit of a number of treaties. My thoughts always been that the UN system works on the, what I call a stovepipe syndrome. Climate change initiatives are independent of the ozone depletion initiatives. And in fact, at one point in time under the Montreal Protocol, we accepted substitutes for CFCs that were actually global warming compounds. So this is part of the problem. And if you look at seed problems in the UN system, to me, we've never been able to create a security council, an environmental security council, analogous to the war and peace council exists there. And we need a catalyst of power brokers in a global context to bring about the framework to take global action, especially when there's dynamic consequences, totally evident like climate change. So I, my, my question is, what do you think of that observation or view? Oh, that's, that's legal realism at its finest. You know, um, you're absolutely right. Why do we not have certain councils in place? In fact, I think it was the Harvard um, International Law Journal. They had a fabulous talk in March of this year. And in that talk, you know, they reflected on A, the severity of these harms that constitute ecocide, the lack of accountability, the lack of deterrence at the international level. And most importantly, the role that the Rome Statute plays in amending or expanding the court's jurisdiction of the crime of ecocide. Mm -hmm. And they also looked at how, how do we criminalize ecocide and the advocacy currently underway to expand the jurisdiction. That seems to me the biggest issue is the jurisdictional challenges or limits, whatever the case may be. And you know, when we look at some of those challenges, those can easily be mitigated with you know, expert panels working to report, to include the lived experiences of victimization of those who are bearing the brunt of you know, a warming planet, of climate change. I mean, we need only turn on our televisions and flip through the news. I mean, we're seeing places in the South that are being destroyed, devastated, literally, you know, due to rising sea levels. Certain countries may be washed away in about 20 years, but you know, for some reason we, we stall when it comes to 
taking this seriously and having these experts weigh in on what we can do to create accountability measures to deter the harmful effects that lead to climate change. Just one observation. I think the, one of the fundamental problems is economic consist, you know, considerations rule. It's Absolutely. louder than everything else. And unless we can look and degrade the economic benefits in the context of long-term econ economic consequences for the planet at large, then we're gonna end up with this, this, this idea of specialized High, you know, high profile international corporations really setting the rules behind the scenes. And that's why we have in green criminology a political economy approach to looking at state environmental crime and corporate environmental crime. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So I'm sorry, uh, Zach Jacobson, I've just seen your question. Can you, are you prepared to answer your, ask your question now, please? Yes, thank you. Thank, thanks for calling on me and, and thanks for. Uh, Thanks for the talk, I've enjoyed it. Um, I do have a question, and if it sounds like a challenge, I'm afraid it is. Um, we've been, a bunch of us, Peter is one of them, Peter McKinnon, um, spent some time um, wondering how we can uh, avoid the kind of onrushing uh, catastrophe and, and civilizational collapse, uh, nakedly just due to uh, climate catastrophes all over. Um, is it possible that this eco, uh, e ecology, uh, eco-legal movement can move fast enough to make a difference? And I really mean fast enough, uh, 30 years outside, 20 well, years. Yeah, I mean, hopefully in my lifetime, I mean, when we look at, uh, you know, unborn generations, I mean, what, what planet will they be inheriting? Uh, that's a fabulous question. And I wish I had the capacity to answer such a question. I mean. It's taken so long, I mean, the year is 2022 and we still have the ICC kind of dragging its feet and you know, looking at certain ways to find loopholes to avoid the criminalization of ecocide. I mean, it's for me, it's just mind boggling how we haven't had the proper measures in place, the proper councils in place, the global commons. I mean, you know, the, the environment is a global common. We sh that should have been the number one thing on the agenda when we looked at global peace and security, right, is protecting the environment. Um, as I mentioned with Ukraine, right, in the invasion of Ukraine and what's happening there. I mean, certain landscapes, certain you know, biodiverse habitats are gonna be destroyed for generations, right? We saw this with Iraq and the use of depleted uranium. To this day, that soil is laced in uranium and it is affecting so many citizens leading to increased rates of cancer, tuberculosis, uh, physical deformities, you know, we have to shift our mindset and see the planet as a shared common, this public trust that we need to protect collectively. And that philosophical awakening is going to take longer than I hope it would have. The, the, the war in Ukraine, actually, it's, it's not just the, uh, the landscape in Ukraine, but what it's doing to the, the global effort uh, uh, to fight uh, global warming is, is, is nothing short of disasters. Surely everybody knows that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. It has the potential to uh, deal with the overpopulation problem in the, in the near future. <laughs> uh, so, David, is uh, uh, is, your, is Jean ready to, to uh, do her part? Yes, I am. Oh, thanks, Jean. So, Jean Dorothy is, is the chair of the KCOR, and so I'd like to call on her to, to say thanks to, to Dr. Oman. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ted. Um, Dr. Omroth, it is my pleasure and privilege to be able to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association of Club of Rome. You have given a very interesting and very informative talk on a subject that very few of us have really had a chance to look at in any detail. We are all skirting around the edges, but this has been very interesting, and I would like to thank you very, very much for this presentation that you gave us. Um, with that, uh, we're, I'm going to turn that Dave is right beside me and we're going to share screen for a minute and I'm going to put on the final slide for us. And um, 
At the end of all of these presentations, for those of you who are here and are not a member of KCORE, I would strongly urge you to go to our website, CanadianCore.com, and look at the section called Stay Informed. And if you log on to that, or if you look at that, you will be able to see this recording of this particular presentation, as well as all the other presentations that we have had over the, our Zoom session. Um, you will also get information about can, um, KCOR, and if you are interested in joining our organization and, and pushing forward on, um, on the forms that we're looking at, you have the ability to um, join and find the memberships on our CanadianCore.com. So I thank you again very much for a fabulous presentation, and I look forward to, uh, to more discussion in a few minutes. There we go.